The, one of the interesting things about, about putting this, uh, this event together is that we give the speakers a very open brief. We say we want them to talk about, about inspiration, about creativity from their perspective. And we look for, we look for the most interesting people we can uh, to do that. What's particularly interesting is the way the threads then emerge out of those discussions. So I was talking to our next speaker a couple of weeks ago about what he's going to talk about. And it's about a inspiration as a process, which chimes so neatly with what Nick Bennett was saying earlier on about, about making inspiration. I think that's you know, one, of the, one of the big things that, that, that I've been thinking about today and, and since talking to talking to our next speaker, is that it is, is inspiration as process. Inspiration is something you can make happen rather than just being passively uh, a recipient of. And so, um, really delightful to be able to introduce uh, John Farker-Smith. Thank you very much. Um, I run a company called Flux, and we produce events. Um, the best thing I can do is to show you two minutes of some of the events we've produced. If a picture is a thousand words, a moving picture I think is a hundred thousand words, so there's about a million words about to appear on the screen. Noel, are you ready? Okay, can you run it please? Thank you. Um, yes, <laughs> I have so much fun. Um, let me start. Uh, I'm slightly out of sorts here because normally I'm at the back there looking at the back of your heads, helping the people getting on this stage. So suddenly I've, I've been spending the past half an hour feeling the anxiety and doing the anxiety <laughs> displacement that I stop in other people to myself. And what I need is myself to stand there going, it's fine, don't worry. It's, well, you have to go out there and be yourself and be nice and, and talk and you'll, they'll like the work. So, um, yes, I just thought I'd share that with you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, we're called Flux um, and we produce events. And Flux means change. We chose the name because in our industry the only, the only constant is change. The only thing that remains the same is that everything changes. Um, our clients want different things. They want events. And we... we when we made the company, we've kept it really small because if you create, create a big company, it, it gets into uh, habits of making things the same way again and again and again. How small are we? There's two of us, and one of us is part-time. So 
how do we deliver those events? We put together uh, what we call a team of talented individuals. We go to the industry and we get handpick the best people to do the jobs. And then my job is to put it all together like that so it fits seamlessly. Um, we run an open book budget, so we show everybody what everything costs, and we uh, charge a fee. Now, I don't need to explain to any of you the advantages for both, everybody for that. Um, that's the sales pitch, so that's done. Now we'll talk about the ideas bit, because that's what I think I'm here to talk about. Um, there we go. We do need to know what we're doing to hire the right people. Um, and what we essentially do is generate ideas, resource the ideas, and then we deliver the ideas. If the client has the idea, it's so much better, because it's their idea. They're motivated to, to, to engage with it, and we help them deliver it. Um, somebody called us DHL once, because they thought we were a very good delivery company. I, I said I didn't think they were that, that good. Um, <laughs> um, what I'm really going to talk about here, um, when I stop babbling a bit, is how do you turn a concept into a reality? How do you turn an idea into an event? We've got a simple mantra to do this, and it's make it clear, make it real, and make it happen. Um, we think it takes about 15 steps. And the first of these five steps is to do with clarification. So make it clear. What is the idea? Is it a word? Is it a phrase? Is it a picture? Is it a rather cumbersome uh, idea in a light bulb? Uh, draw it, write it down, just get it down on paper. It doesn't need to be finished because you're really only just starting the process. Let me give you an example in Arabic. Uh, we were sent this by the Omani government, um, and what this translates as is celebrate 40 years of peace and prosperity in Oman. Um, you saw on the showreel the big flower. It was made of 12,500 children who were cast uh, that we spent 18 months rehearsing and doing an hour and a half long show. Um, 18 months later, after receiving this as a brief, we deliver the world's biggest mass choreography event with a cast of 12,500 children telling the story of their nation. I can tell you it was the biggest and still is the biggest mass choreography event because the team that did it for us in Oman came to London to the, the uh, London uh, Olympic opening ceremony and Martin, who's the executive producer, who's a very, very dear friend, said, right, we want to do it bigger than Oman. And they all just went around and said, nope, we're not doing it. 12,500 is as big as it will ever get. It's just too logistically complicated. Um, so from one, one line brief in Arabic to this huge event, um, it was quite a journey. But of course, it started with a first, succinct first step. From small acorns, great oaks grow. Second step to making it clear involves the most important element in, of any event. And if you turn to your left and look over there, and turn to your right and look over there, you'll see them. And I'm talking about people. Because who is the event for is fundamental to what you're doing. Who, what do you want people to experience? How many of them will experience it? What will they share? And what will they, you want them to think about and feel as being part of their experience? Let me, um, let me give you another example. Illuminating Hadrian's Wall. This was a, uh, a brief, uh, our second shortest brief we ever got, which is three words. And they said, illuminate Hadrian's Wall. <laughs> it was for the Northumberland Tourist Board who wanted to increase um, say, uh, uh, people coming to the region. So he came up with this brilliant idea uh, of a line of light 84 miles long uh, from the east coast to the west coast, describing the original route of Hadrian's Wall. And we looked at doing all kinds of ways, and the way we ended up doing it was the way the Romans did it, because in Roman times, the way they used to send messages along the wall was with burners. And by some strange quirk of fate, every mile on Hadrian's Wall, there is a mile castle. So what we did is we broke up, crazy old-fashioned idea, broke the wall up into 84-mile sections, and then we put 12 burners in each section. Sorry, four burners in each section. But then we had 24 sections. Sorry, 42 sections. Um, we then had groups of four people in, in groups of 48 who would go to the 12 different uh, burner positions. So every 250 metres for 84 miles, there was a, a specialised burner with calor gas that burnt for an hour and a half that we lit an hour before sunset and lit for an hour and a half. And then we flew a helicopter over it and recorded it. Um, what could possibly go wrong? 
Well, actually, not very, as it happened, we, we were very fortunate and we did a lot of planning, um, and uh, it was a very successful event. The people who came to it, the volunteers who went up to make the, the, the burners, were 12, sorry, 2,600. Um, the great thing was, though, that it was the first sunny day of the year up in, up in Northumberland, and we had uh, 120,000 people come up and watch it. So we had this huge gathering along the length of the wall, which was just quite extraordinary. Um, the third thing to make it clear is to decide where you're going to do the event. Um, there's no point in developing an idea if there's no place for it. Uh, place and the idea will affect each other profoundly. Another example? Uh, some of you, with the greatest respect, look as though you might remember who the Pet Shop by Boys were, who you might have been in the 80s listening to them on your Walkman. Um, they, they approached us uh, with... Uh, uh, they'd rescored the, the film score for Battleship Potemkin, and they wanted to do it publicly. So we helped them stage a big event in Trafalgar Square with 36,000 of their closest friends, um, uh, and to huge critical and uh, artistic success. And Neil came... came comes from Newcastle, so he wanted to do it in his hometown. Now, uh, Swan Hunter Shipyard, the biggest uh, employer in the region since, since Victorian times, um, said that we could do it there. Two days before we did our event, they officially closed the shipyard. So on the day of the event, we had 14, 15,000 people coming down, often in groups of three or four generations, three generations, uh, and huge extended families of mothers, fathers, uncles, brothers, cousins, sons and daughters, all who had worked in the shipyard and were coming to say goodbye to, the, to their memories. It's where their family histories had been made. I use that example because, again, location is really, really important. The where is really important, as, as is timing. Um, once you've got your location, you can then set a date. And only by identifying the end can you really begin. Once the data is set, you can clarify everything else. I, again, I'll give you another example. Uh, this map shows the 69 locations of the torch relay sites that we did. Um, we had to do a two-hour show every day to make a focal point of the end of each day for every lo location. And we had a show that was two hours long, an hour of which changed every day because we put a load of local content in. We didn't get any chance to rehearse any of this, but what we had to do was ensure that when the torch arrived, that it was seamlessly dovetailed into the, the end of the show because we had to hit TV deadlines, broadcast deadlines, and all the rest of it. Um, which, again, was, was fairly challenging, but we did it. So by the time you've done it 50, 40 or 50, 30 or 40 times, it gets quite easy. By the time you're doing 60 or 70 times, it becomes second nature. Um, but again, this shows the logistics were complicated, but the final delivery date of the final show was the opening, cere opening ceremony of the Olympics. Luckily for us, that date had been put in stone seven years before, but the sooner you can get set, set the date, the sooner you can get organized. Now, in terms of clarity, there's one thing that nobody ever wants to talk about, about when they're doing an event. In fact, they don't really want to talk about it in many things. And that is budget. We always say to our clients, set the budget. If you don't set the budget, you're wasting everybody's time. A brilliant idea may be a brilliant idea, but if your client cannot afford it, there's no point to it. And you spend all the time doing it. And you, you, you tease them and, and some People use it as a technique to get a bigger job. It never works. A small budget, however, does not necessarily mean a small idea. I'll give you... There's a convention going on here, so I'll give you another example. Uh, Amnesty International approached us... Uh, I worked as a consultant for them for three years, and we, uh, they wanted to celebrate the 60th anniversary of the Declaration of Human Rights, the fundamental tenet on which human rights charities have been based for 60 years. And they didn't really have very much money, but what they did have was hundreds of supporter groups all over the, all over the world. And we thought, well, how can we get this, this small amount of money and how can we maximize the usage of it? So we prepared uh, an event toolkit, if you will, very simple document. We translated it into Arabic, into German, French and Spanish, and we sent it to 100 different supporter groups. And the idea was basically, 
achieve that, make the amnesty candle out of human beings, people standing up for human rights, with a light source. Peter Berenson's um, uh, tenant on which he, he set up Amnesty International, as you all know, is it's better to light a candle than shout at the darkness. And that's why the Amnesty candle is, is, is the logo. So we took that, people's activity, to make the candle. We sent it out to, I think it was uh, 100 different groups. I can't remember how many different, 46 different countries. And they came back with literally thousands of images. All different versions, some very sophisticated, some very simpl simplistic, some kind of uh, uh, honest in their simplicity. Um, and we amplified hundreds of, th hundreds of thousands of online views into millions of pounds of media coverage, and all because Amnesty said, we've only got 19,500 pounds. And we turned it into something absolutely spectacular. So once you've got clarity, once you know what the idea is, once you're clear about what you're doing, now you've got to make it real. Now, this bit's not as, quite as complicated as the last bit. How do you color in the blanks? How do, you, how do you put life in it? The next five steps are quite simple because we all perceive things in the same way. If you, we see stuff. So you want to make the idea visible, what is it? Is it an art installation? Is it, is it lighting? Is it darkness? Is it a bit of sculpture? Is it something you can see? Is it, something, is it a picture? Is it a painting? We all hear. So if you make the or, or idea audible, what does, he, what does the guest hear? Is it a soundscape? Is it music? Is it silence? Is it speeches? Is it, is it you know, on a, an event like this, I, we've had, we might have been, we might have in the past used laughter tracks or applause tracks to, to amplify the, the entertainment. And if I want to get somebody off stage when they're speaking and they're overrunning, what I'll do is I'll cut the microphone so you can't hear them and then I'll start an applause track. And that will soon get them off stage because the audience start applauding and then they have to leave the stage. It's a, it, I would never, we should have actually admitted to that, but uh, it's a, a little technique. Um, I've written here, we smell. No, smell. Um, uh, if you, take the, if you make the idea olfactable, what does the guest smell? Uh, this is often overlooked, but smell is the main uh, uh, sensation that, that associates with memory. So you, maybe the smell of chocolate reminds you of when your mum used to bake cakes, or, or newly mown grass remembers, reminds you of a summer's day. I know that um, estate agents love uh, to say that they sell more houses when there are a smell, smell of baking bread or coffee. Romance the nose. Taste, if you make the idea gustable, what do the guests taste? A baby's first cry is for sustenance. They're calling for food. If you feed your guests, if you give them good food, they will be happier. If you give them a drink, they will, they will slake their thirst. Um, and it's fundamental to their experience. Touch, how do you make the idea palpable? What does the guest touch? We're talking about texture, we're talking about temperature. In fact, when I, when I was shown that I had the second slot after lunch, I asked the venue to turn the air conditioning up a little bit because you've all just eaten. Your bodies are now digesting. The sugar in your bodies is making you a little bit sleepy. So a little bit of, um, uh, a little bit of cooler temperature helps you stay awake. So we see, we hear, we smell, we taste, and we touch. An example? Uh, a major finance brand asked us to hold 200 VIPs at the opening of an art exhibition called Desire Unbound. We knew there were, we were, there were VIPs because they rented the Tate Modern for this. Um, timings and budgets were all established, and the creative brief was, simple, was simply the name of the exhibition, Desire Unbound. And yes, that's the shortest brief we've ever had, two words. I defy anybody to give us one, one word. Um, um, anyway, guests came into the Great Turbine Hall and we rigged up huge liquid nitrogen canisters which poured out uh, basically smoke, which you lit pink. As they walked through the smoke, they could feel the cool of the li liquid nitrogen. We feel that we had different scents in the air, with the scent of 1920s Paris, Golwa cigarettes, coffee, red wine, and I want to say wet fish, but, but I shouldn't really say that. It's a surrealism joke and it'll never go down well, as I've just proven. Um, <laughs> Um, they arrived in the central hall. Uh, again, I'm going back to fish. I haven't really got to stop this. Um, um, the food and drink were served. It was all basically based on lobsters and, and, and fish because of the surrealism joke again. Um, and then at the end of the evening, unbound, a number of trapeze artists tumbled down from the ceiling, performing an aerial show, and then descended from the ropes to join the guests. Uh, for the guests, 
the surreal had become real, their desire had quite literally been unbound. It's a little play on words, but it was quite effective, and their experiences were quite unforgettable. Okay, we've concentrated on the event, a moment in time, but what happens before and after the event is what we think is really important. With the event in the middle, you start with a launch, you then promote, there's your event, you then broadcast the event, and then you extend the event. Right, launch. What is the most unique aspect of your idea? What are the best things about it? Why is it a good idea? Basically, you get those, you list them out, you tell your guests, you tell the press in that order. That becomes your launch. Promote. You take the rest of the items on the list, the ones you haven't used, you then feed those in, drip feed those into the press and your audience to get an idea of, uh, of excitement. That's promotion. The event, of course, is going to be spectacular and superb, so you are going to want to... Uh, broadcast it. So why limit it to the people in the room? Why not, as we're doing today, why not record it? Why not post it online? Social, and, and, uh, social media is, is, is all about extension, I think. Um, and finally, we get to the end. Um, extend the event success. If you've gone to all the trouble of creating this incredible experience, you should really milk it for all it's worth. And what aspects of the idea can be used after the event to create further mileage? I know the Twitter and the blogosphere all, all, all go mad. But this is how you maintain and you control the memories of an event. Uh, it would be foolish of me not to use an example. Um, we were asked to produce the return of the secret policeman's ball at the Royal Albert Hall for Channel 4 and an amnesty. And we brought back the com legendary comedy, comedy show. We said we were going to do it. We didn't tell anybody who was going to be in it, largely because we didn't know, because nobody would commit to it. But th they didn't know that. Anyway, as people committed, we... Uh, we leaked, or we leaked the, thing, the, the names of the press. By the time the tickets went on sale, 5,500 tickets sold out in a matter of minutes because there was a kind of a frenzy about it. Uh, the show itself was, was an instant sellout, um, and uh, the broadcast, we topped the TV ratings uh, that night. It was a Saturday night in the UK. We simulcast, which is quite unusual for then, it's about eight years ago, we simulcast to 26 picture house theatres, and we broadcast to 11 different countries all with an eight-minute delay from going live to, 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 to broadcast. Um, we also recorded all the activity backstage, various performers, Eddie and, and Bush, having a good time afterwards and basically celebrating, and we posted all that stuff online. That's it. It's, 50, it's our 15 steps. What's the idea? Who is the idea for? Where is it? When is it? How much does it cost? What does it look like? What does it sound like? What does it smell like? What does it taste like? What does it feel like? And then launch it, promote it, do the event, broadcast the event, extend the event. If you make it clear and if you make it real, you will make it happen. Thank you very much.